Welcome everybody. I'm Jason Hamilton from the Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences at Ithaca College. And this afternoon we're going to talk about education for sustainability. What is education for sustainability? Well, there's really two parts to that question. One is, is as an educator, if you're going to educate for sustainability, you have to know what does that mean? What are you doing uh, in the classroom? What are you doing on the ground? But before you can even make that decision, you have to really look at this word sustainability carefully and decide what is sustainability. Uh, there's as many definitions of the word sustainability as there are probably people uh, in this room. And so the question then is, is if we don't have a common definition, uh, then as we discuss it, uh, we're really speaking different languages. If you look up the definition of the word sustainability in the dictionary, uh, you get this, um, which is really not particularly helpful, right? Of course, we all knew that. And what this points to is that there's a difference between the common usage of a word, or the broad usage, which in this case just means to carry on something, and the more technical usage of the term, which we mean when we're talking about sustainability uh, in, in this sense. So what is being sustained? That really becomes the question. Are we sustaining um, something? Are we sustaining the status quo? What is being sustained? And then the other question is, is how long are you sustaining it for? Is sustainability something that lasts for a year or a decade or a century? And if you don't get your mind around these questions, you really can't have uh, a conversation where you're having good communication with each other. So since sustainability, we all know, kind of have, might have something to do with kind of environmental stuff, uh, what I've done is I've gone to the EPA website and I've pulled up their definition of sustainability. So this is a verbatim quote from the EPA website. What is sustainability? Sustainability is based on a simple principle. Everything that we need for our survival and well-being depends either directly or indirectly on our natural environment. So some of you might say, well, that's in alignment with what you thought about sustainability. Others of you might think, well, that's not in alignment. But let's look at that definition for a second and realize that there's really there's two fundamental problems with that as a definition for sustainability. First, it focuses on environmental issues. Everything is directly or indirectly um, um, based on the natural environment. If sustainability was just about environmental issues, then why do we need a different term for it? Why don't we just call it environmentalism or ecology or something like that? Also, what about things like people not getting enough to eat? Not because there's not enough production in the area, but because there's inappropriate distribution mechanisms. That must be some part of sustainability also. The second problem with this statement is that it's just blatantly false. Um, everything that we need for survival doesn't depend uh, on our natural environment. What about the fact that we are human beings and we uh, depend for survival on our psychological well-being and our emotional well-being as well as our physical well-being? What about love? What about feeling that there is hope for the future? What about feeling that you're not being oppressed or that there is a rule of law? These things don't necessarily just uh, talk about environmental issues. So sustainability has to be more than just this. So if the EPA can't get it, let's just take another example. Another place where you hear the word sustainability a lot is in uh, the popular media in the business world. So I've gone to one of the paragons, shall we say, of the business world, um, Walmart. And this is, again, directly off of the Walmart website where there's a sustainability tab. And if you click the tab, it says right here, at Walmart we know that being an efficient and profitable business and being a good steward of the environment are goals that can work together. Our broad environmental goals at Walmart are simple and straightforward. Notice how the Walmart sustainability has in some sense done exactly what the EPA definition did, which led you from this word, which you were trying to kind of figure out what it meant in all of its nuances, and it led you straight towards environmental issues. Uh, that within two sentences you're talking about environmental goals rather than about sustainability. If you then look down at what the environmental goals are, 100% renewable energy, zero waste, and sell products, basically, uh, what you see is their definition of sustainability is green business. It's renewable energy and, and selling things. Again, this can't possibly be the definition of sustainability, for if it were, we wouldn't need this term, and it wouldn't be the inclusive term 
that it might be. All right, so clearly Walmart doesn't get it either. So if Walmart or business uh, or the popular press doesn't get it and the EPA can't get it and you can go to a number of different sites and none of them are getting it either, let's try a different approach. Let's go look historically and see where did that word come from and what did the people who coined this concept mean when they said sustainability. Well, originally, and here's one of the issues that we're facing today, the word sustainability was an adjective. It wasn't a noun in and of itself. It was a modifier of something else. And the word that it modified was development. Uh, back in the um, early 80s, when uh, people were really looking at the issues that we're facing today, pollution, feeding people, population increase, and um, the pressure this places on both economic systems, cultural systems, and environmental systems, the question was, is what do we do about that? The answer at the time was if you're going, getting more people and they're uh, having increased numbers of needs because just simply there's more of them, then what you need is sustained economic growth. More people means you need more money. Um, you need more money for paying for medicine. You need more money for paying for schools. You need more money for paying for environmental controls. The problem with the concept of sustainable growth is that it's an oxymoron. You can't grow anything forever if the size of the earth isn't, in fact, growing. So thinkers at that time um, said, so since we can't clearly have sustained growth by definition, uh, we need to think about another concept that is meeting the needs of the humans on this planet. So maybe if we can't just simply have getting things bigger, sustained growth, maybe we can have sustained getting things better, uh, even though it's not just bigger. And that's really where the concept of sustainable development came from. What you're sustaining is the improvement, sustained improvement in the condition of humans on this planet. And if you look at the definition then, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, you really start to see what uh, we're trying to get at with this term. It's not just about the environment. It's not just about buying things. It's not just about any one thing, in fact. It's looking at the whole system of what do we need, we people and we, the organisms on this planet, need to be able to meet our needs and at the same time, how do we make decisions that don't make it so our children or future generations of organisms are unable to live on this planet? Now, it doesn't really sound all that controversial that what we really want is to figure out a system of sustained improvement. But as soon as you start to define it or say these words, this is what happens. You get lots of angry faces. People start to argue instantly. Um, what does development mean? What does, what are needs and what aren't? How do we balance the needs of the current generation versus future generations? How do we balance this across countries and across cultural groups and across genders, all these sorts of things? And yes, those are really important issues. Uh, but at the same time, if you devolve into those details too rapidly, of course you don't achieve what was really the noble goal, which is sustained improvement. Uh, in the condition of people and other organisms on this planet. So what that has led many people to argue is that since we can't come up with a definition of this word, that maybe the word is useless. Uh, and in fact, an undefined word has no meaning at all. But again, I think that that's completely inappropriate. If you take fundamental concepts like liberty or justice, um, while nobody can come up with a definition that's universally accepted for liberty or justice, we know very well that these are important concepts in our lives, in the foundation of our countries, and in the way we like to think about humans interacting with each other. So just because you can't define it in a sentence doesn't mean it's useful. What it means is that, in some sense, we know what we're talking about. Yes, the details are blurry, but the overall concept is not um, blurry. So how come, why can't we define this in a word? Why do we get all these issues? 
And I think the easiest way to think about this is to go back to this ancient parable. Uh, this parable goes all the way back to ancient India. It's been told through the centuries in different cultures and different countries. Uh, there's versions in different religions. And I think its staying power is indicative of the importance of this parable. And it's the parable of the blind man and the elephant. One day, um, some blind men uh, who uh, had never met an elephant before were walking down the road and somebody told them that there was an elephant there and they were very excited because they didn't know what an elephant was, they'd never seen an elephant, they were blind uh, and they knew that this must be an impressive new thing so they all decided to, to um, to see what this elephant was using the senses that they had available to them, which in this case was uh, their sense of touch primarily. So one fellow uh, felt the trunk and one fellow felt the side and one fellow over there is feeling the ear, those sorts of things. Then after the elephant left, the blind men were sitting there thinking that was really an awesome experience. It was amazing to be in the presence of such a grand animal. Uh, and wasn't it interesting, one of the monks said, how that elephant was just like a snake. Um, and of course, that was the man who was feeling his trunk. And another of the men said, I don't understand what you're talking about. That wasn't like a snake at all. It was like a tree. And that was the man who was feeling the leg. A third monk said, or a third man said, you guys are both ridiculous. It was like a wall. I put my hands on it, I stretched them up and out and sideways, and that elephant was like a wall. At which point the men all started arguing with each other about what was the nature of this elephant. You can see again the importance of this parable as it goes all the way up into the far side uh, in modern days, for example. Um, and here's exactly the issue with sustainability. That sustainability is um, the elephant. It is the whole. And with our limited senses, in this case, the ability of our experiences and um, the perspectives from which we're coming from, we have, our tr we have trouble putting the whole picture together. And so rather like, than like the elephant where we say it's a spear, it's a wall, it's a fan, we say that sustainability is alternative energy, eating tofu, preserving biodiversity, saving trees, stopping climate change, and on and on and on. Well, who's right? Well, in one important sense, everybody's right because it's all of those things. And in another important sense, none of them are right because it's all of those things. It can't be separated into any individual thing. It's sustained improvement in the condition of people and other organisms on this planet. It's sustained functioning of the life support systems of this planet, keeping aware of the psychological, emotional, and spiritual needs of the people. It's all of those things. So how do we think about all of those things at once? Well, since we can't define it, and we know that um, there's a lot of argument about it uh, in terms of the, the particulars of how do you achieve such a thing, what I've done is I've gone and I've said, well, let's just lay out some of the starting points. Let's try to find a place that we can agree on. And so in um, sustainability, there's kind of four fundamental axioms or principles that are the starting points for which we then determine what are you going to do uh, in the future. So the first point is that the current state of people is not a morally acceptable endpoint. Now you have to read these words very carefully because sometimes people immediately get offended and they say, well, what you're saying is that I'm an immoral person uh, because of the decisions that I've made. That's not at all what this axiom is saying. Again, remember, sustainability is talking about improvement over time. All this means is that we should not be satisfied with the state of the world, humanity on this world, and that we can do better than this. It doesn't mean we could have done better than this. It means we can, in the future, do better than this. So just to give some examples, um, this shows uh, the part, parts of the world where um, there are people below the poverty line. Anywhere where it's blue, uh, there's a significant number of people who are living below poverty line. And the places where it's dark blue, uh, there's um, um, 
really significant proportions of people below the poverty line. Haiti has 41 percent below, Zimbabwe 95 percent, Turkmenistan 60 percent. Now, this is not poverty with defined as defined in relation to the standard of living or the yearly average income of the United States. This is within the country itself. So that means, for example, in Turkmenistan, 60 percent of the people live below um, the standard ability to meet their needs in that country. I would argue that we should be able to do better than that. On a worldwide basis, um, if anybody, if any country in the world is at 0 percent, 1 percent, 2 percent, 10 percent of their population below the poverty line, we should aim that there's no countries where there are 40 percent, 60 percent, 95 percent of the people below poverty line. This is one of the ways of thinking about and measuring, in fact, that we can do better. Another example is people living with water insecurity. In the West, we're very used to the fact that we can get a drink of water whenever we want. Um, you go to your refrigerator, you go to the drinking fountain, you go to the faucet. Uh, many parts of the world, people don't know where their next clean glass of water is going to come from. In this um, picture of the world, anywhere where it's red or yellow are places where um, the people are living with significant water stress. There may be water, but it may not be fit to drink, or there may not be enough water, period. Again, if there's parts of the world where people are living with water security, we shouldn't be satisfied if there's significant portions of the world where a significant amount of the world's population is living with water insecurity. So the first axiom, the current state of people is not a morally acceptable endpoint. I don't think that that is particularly um, controversial. We can do better than we're doing. Again, it doesn't mean we could have done better. It means we can do better. The second starting point or point of agreement is that we've reached a state in this planet at this current time where we're negatively impacting the ability of future generations to live. Again, I don't think this is any great revelation that there's enough people on this planet that we can engage in behaviors which affect the next generation. And in fact, we are engaging in behaviors which are affecting negatively the next generation. Again, that's not saying that everything that we do is bad, not at all. It just means that we, are, we have the ability with the number of people and the amount of technology that we have to start paying close attention. Here is just, again, an example. This is a photograph of the Earth at night. This is an actual satellite composite. It's not a, it's not, um, a cartoon. Now, I know that the Earth isn't at night all at once in any one place. So this is um, several photographs put together. The lights represent cities, and in a few cases, forest fires. Um, but uh, to a very um, strong correlation, the amount of light that you see coming from a place is uh, representative of population numbers and, in fact, uh, impact, environmental impact on this area. So the question here is, is, is the world small or large with respect to the amount of impact that people are having? Um, you can see that a significant proportion of the world now is lit up at night. Humans are having a huge impact on this planet and populations are growing. Now you might say, well, there's still a lot of the world left. For example, there's lots of empty space over here. Well, that's the Sahara Desert. There's a reason why there's not a, lights, a lot of lights over there. And as you go across the world and you look at the big empty spaces, they really fall into two categories, either they're deserts or else they're the rainforest areas of, the, uh, of South America and of Africa. So the last large functioning ecosystems in the world uh, are the rainforests, where in fact some of the highest uh, population pressures are expected to occur. So again, this does not mean that uh, we in the West or we in the North have the ability to go in and tell other countries how to manage their resources or what to do. What it does mean, though, if we're starting to take this global picture, the point is, is that there's enough people on this world, we're having enough impact on this world, that we have to start thinking about global level impacts of humanity and the ability of future generations to live. 
Now, not taking this taking this out of the realm of just pictures, um, a group of scientists um, uh, about ten years ago were tasked with coming up with baseline data for the status of the world's life support systems. Let's get this out of opinion. Let's get this out of pictures. Let's actually come up with ways to measure the life support systems of this planet, and let's look and see what's happening with those life support systems. Now, they didn't use the term life support systems. They used the term ecosystem services or natural functions of the Earth. So this document, the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment, if you were to pile up all the books on the floor, it would stand four or five feet tall. This is a huge report. And again, this was a summary of existing data. If you take all those volumes and you then say, all right, what's the, what, how can we abstract down just the technical takeaways? You end up with the technical summaries of each of those documents. If you then say, all right, let's take out the technical information and just, just summarize the main points, you come up with the summaries for policymakers. If you then take all the summaries for policymakers from all the various parts of the report and pull one short summary together for the general public, you come up with an even shorter document. And within that document, you summarize the entire thing in one sentence, which is right there. Human activity is putting such a strain on the natural functions of Earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. So I've given talks like this 300 times, something like that, a lot of times. And every single time I see this quote, it essentially makes my heart skip a beat all over again. The reason for that is I've read those reports. I know the people who wrote those reports. I contributed data to some of those reports. This was not a bunch of people just coming out stating a particular ideological perspective. This was not a bunch of people just talking in the hallway saying, what do you think? This was the conclusion of more than 1,400 scientists after looking at the actual data in terms of the processes that keep us alive and concluding that the trends are leading us towards this, that we can't assume that this planet is going to properly take care of our children. Pretty sobering. For example, um, everybody's heard about CO2 in the atmosphere at this point, uh, unless you just don't watch any media at all. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is changing atmospheric composition of CO2 is one tiny part of a whole field of atmospheric global change. I'm a global change biologist, and changing CO2 in the atmosphere is only one tiny part of what uh, we do. As it turns out, in fact, the composition of the atmosphere is changing. It's changing extremely rapidly, and it's not just a little more CO2 here or there. It's all of the biogenic gases <coughs> and some of the non-biogenic, that means gases that are made by living things. We're fundamentally changing the entire way that the atmosphere of this planet operates by changing many of the compositions of the gases. If you look at this graph, the bottom axis is years, starting 10,000 years ago, going up till the present. The y-axes are concentrations of different gases. So the top one is CO2. That's what we've all heard about. There's been this steady um, increase from about 10,000 years ago up till about the last century. That's natural fluctuation. Um, then you see this straight up spike going from um, the late 1800s, early 1900s till now. That's not natural fluctuation. You might say, well, CO2 is just strange. Let's look at a different gas. How about methane? You see the same thing. What if you turn your sensors to a different gas? Say, how about nitrous oxide? You get the same thing. This is the fingerprint of humanity changing the atmospheric composition of this planet. It's not just a little bit of CO2 here and there, as if that wasn't um, important enough to worry about. And given that, just briefly, yes, global climate change is, in fact, real, despite what you might hear uh, from some particular sources. Now, um, this is, that is a different lecture. But the point here is that even though the public became aware of this word, global warming, in the late 80s, 
Uh, the scientific community has been working on this for more than two centuries. Now, two centuries ago, nobody was studying global warming, but we were studying, scientists were studying what controls the temperature of this planet. Two centuries of experiments and data have now shown us that we have a pretty good idea, not for any particular spot, not down to the one degree here or there, but on average across the whole world, we have a pretty good idea of what controls the temperature of this planet. And the bottom line is, is that we're changing it. There's no question about that. The data are unequivocal. And you can see it. You don't need to look at graphs and charts and go through esoteric data sets. Um, you can see that the world is changing. This is a photograph of the Muir Glacier in Alaska. Uh, the glacier is coming downhill here. It's going out towards the ocean this direction. Uh, this was taken in August of 1941. And if you look over here, what do you see? There's like rocks and dirt. It's cold. There's a glacier there, after all. Um, <coughs> this is exactly the same spot uh, in August of 2004. So if you say 1941, there's a glacier and there's rocks. 2004, no glacier and the rocks are covered up. Now that isn't just some grass or flowers growing, that's woody vegetation. This is a sign that life is redistributing itself around this world because of climate change. And again, that's what global change biologists study. This is what we're watching. If it wasn't changing, we wouldn't have anything to look at and I would be doing something else. So the glacier, gone. In fact, there's the receding melted tongue. And I didn't just pick out the one glacier in the world that's melting. There's dozens of these glacial pear pictures where you can see it with your own eyes that not only is the ice melting, life is redistributing itself as a point, as a result of this temperature increase. And so we've commenced a giant experiment where we're just seeing what's going to happen now. So we have two axioms now. Axiom number one is that we can do better. And axiom number two is we're affecting the life support systems of this planet. Axiom number three then is that the major types of problems that we have to deal with have to be addressed simultaneously. There's no ranking of importance. And in fact, this is one of the ones where much of the argument happens, where people who are interested in, say, environmental issues, and people who are interested in, say, economic issues, and people who are interested in, say, social justice or social issues, will argue with each other about who's, um, whose perspective is more important or whose problem is more important. And of course, this then leads nowhere because the answer is, is you can't solve any of them without solving all of them. And I'll just give you an example. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a philanthropic organization, they give money to good causes. One of the causes that they give money to is vaccination programs for polio and measles in the Niger Delta region of Africa. And how could you possibly disagree with the goal, which is reducing the rates of polio and measles in the Niger Delta region of Africa? I think everybody would agree that that's a good thing to do. We don't necessarily like the fact that children are dying of polio and measles. Now here's where things get um, more complex. Where does that money come from? Well, the money comes from investments. And so the money that they have first is invested in a number of organizations, but one, of the org one group of organizations is Royal Dutch Shell, Exxon, and Chevron. What do they do? Well, those companies, as it turns out, have significant refinery operations in the Niger Delta of Africa. Because of different environmental controls in those regions, they flare the natural gas that comes off those uh, refineries, which leads to particulates in the air. Those particulates in the air lead to respiratory problems in the children. What's the parent's reaction when their children have chronic respiratory issues? Well, one thing is that they don't walk the distance to go to the vaccine clinics, so that reduces the vaccination rates of polio and measles in the Niger Delta. The second thing it does is that constant assault on their immune system reduces their immune function and makes them more susceptible to polio and measles. So what you have here is one organization working at exactly cross purposes with itself. One part of it is trying to reduce polio and measles 
uh, in the Niger Delta. And another part of it is trying to increase polio and measles in the Niger Delta. Now listen to my words really carefully. I'm not saying that they're doing it on purpose. When I say they're trying to do it, I'm not saying that they're evil. I'm not saying that they have any evil intent. But that's the bottom line of the actions, is that the actions are increasing it in this direction. So because you haven't tried to deal with different issues simultaneously, because you haven't taken a systems approach, this is what you get. The breakdown here is the firewall that's placed between what you do with the money and how you get the money in the first place. And as long as you keep a separation between those two things, you're going to have a system that's set up to produce this sort of potential behavior. So the point then is that you have to address these different sorts of problems at exactly the same time. The last point, or the last starting point for agreement uh, of sustainability is the system, in fact, isn't broken. Now this often shocks people and say, what, you've just been giving me all these examples of all these problems. Of course the system's broken. And I would say the system is not broken at all. In fact, the system is operating exactly as it was designed to operate. Again, that doesn't mean we did it on purpose. But there's a well-known adage of um, systems thinking that is the central law of improvement. And the central law of improvement states that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it achieves. Again, that doesn't mean that you did it on purpose. What it means, though, is you set up the relationships among the parts of your system to get the behavior that you get. And yes, it might be a surprise, but the system is, is working exactly as you designed it to work. The Bill Gates Foundation getting um, where the money is going and where the money is coming from working at cross purposes is the result of a system that has a firewall between those two parts of the organization. That's just what happens when, when you set systems up that way. If you wanted to design the perfect geoengineering machine to take Earth and turn it into Mars, how would you do it? Well, the atmosphere of Earth has a lot of free oxygen in it. The atmosphere of Mars has no free oxygen in it. What's the difference? There's carbon in the atmosphere of Mars that has combined with the oxygen to make the atmosphere be primarily carbon dioxide. So how would you turn Earth to Mars? You would take every bit of stored carbon from underground and you would put it out into the atmosphere as fast as you absolutely possibly could. How would you get a system to do that? You would design it so that every single human on this planet, it, complete economic well-being relied on getting every last bit of carbon out of the ground as fast as they possibly could. And look what we have. That's exactly the system that we have. Did anybody say we were trying to turn the Earth's atmosphere to look more like the Martian atmosphere? Of course not, but that's the system that we have in place. So where do we keep going wrong? Why do we keep having these unforeseen consequences or what systems people call surprises in our systems design? And when we try to have things that fix things, we just get other surprises. And the real problem here is that we fall into the 50 simple things trap. This book, which was published uh, in the 80s, um, that in fact has done a lot of good to try to get people to think about environmental issues, uh, has also then um, conveyed this idea that when you have a bunch of problems, that you can solve them by simple things. And look how this has propagated across both language uh, as well as subject area. Wouldn't it be nice if there was 50 simple things you could do and all of a sudden all children would be fit? Wouldn't it be great if there was 50 simple things you could do and all of a sudden every child would love math? The world just doesn't work like that. Wouldn't it be great if there was 50 simple things we could do to save the earth? Again, if you look at it this way, it's ludicrous. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do the actions that are in any of these books. They're all great, but we need a system redesign for those actions to matter. What this makes me think of is one time I was leading a group of adult learners in a wilderness 
um, skills workshop and we were teaching these adults to light fires by rubbing sticks together. Now in order to light fire by rubbing sticks together, the sticks have to match at certain angles in order to get the friction that you need in order to generate the heat. So this fellow that I was helping, his sticks weren't matching right, so um, I needed to um, carve on one of them and get, get the shape slightly different. So I drew out my knife, which was a big knife because it was a bushcraft knife, and I went to carve on this wood. Now as I was pulling this knife out of the sheath, I literally felt an earthquake. I lived in Santa Barbara for 12 years, Santa Barbara, California. I know what earthquakes feel like. And I'm thinking to myself, this is so cool. I had no idea that they had earthquakes in New York. And I'm at the same time that part of my brain is thinking that, another part of my brain is thinking, I don't understand why nobody else is feeling this earthquake. I can feel the very bones of my body vibrating in this earthquake. Well, as I looked around trying to solve this mystery, what I realized is that I had grabbed the sheath of the knife too high. So as the knife was being drawn out of the sheath, it cut my finger to the bone in about the first half inch of the draw. And so I had a knife blade this long that I was drawing across the bone of my finger. So as it turns out, um, attempting to saw your own finger off with a knife feels like an earthquake because you're getting the vibration running up through the bones of your arm, skeleton, of the skeletal system of your arm. Um, so by the time I realized this, however, um, I had drawn the knife completely across the bone of my finger. And as I looked down, the pant legs, my pant leg was completely soaked with blood from my hip to my knee. Subcutaneous fat was hanging out. All the insides were on the outsides. This was really disgusting. And so I'm thinking to myself, I cut myself. I mean, what are you supposed to think when you do something like that? I'm out in the woods. I was the instructor, and I just was attempting to saw my own finger off. So it shows you the strange psychology of disasters in some sense. Uh, and the 50 simple things thinking is that I thought to myself, I got to do something. So I did. I took all the subcutaneous fat and various other pieces. I stuffed it all back in. I pinched the wound closed. And I went right back to what I was doing. 50 simple things. Kind of luckily for me, the fellow I was working with got faint at the sight of blood. And he said, Jason, shouldn't you do something about that? And again, my reaction was, I did do something about it. I stuffed it all back in and pinched it closed, didn't I? Well, that then got me thinking rationally again, where I realized you have to change fundamentally what you're doing. Yes, you need to put the stuff back in. Yes, you need to pinch it closed. No, you don't go back to doing exactly what you're doing. You stop what you're doing. You go to the hospital. You get your finger stitched back together. Yes, and now my finger works again. That is the 50 simple things trap. Yes, you need to do those things. You also need to step back and stop and do something else. So then we have the four axioms, the four starting points, the four agreements for sustainability. Um, every one of these things are based both in logic as well as in data. Now once you have these starting points, which I think most people can agree on, at least in principle, what do you do? How do you now redesign a system that um, is going to take into account these fundamental realities. Well, the first thing that you have to do is you have to decide what do you want? What do you want your system to produce, so to speak? Do you want your system to produce money? Do you want your system to produce stuff? Well, maybe we want our system to produce healthy children. Now, I don't just mean healthy bodies. Because yes, of course, everybody would like it if our children are healthy. But if your children are depressed or if they are psychologically traumatized, um, that's not good enough, right? So when I say we want to produce a system that makes healthy children, we mean physical health and mental health and emotional health and spiritual health and as many other dimensions of health as we need to add in there to have fully actualized, happy, healthy children. So let's just go then and abstract this to a circle to indicate all the different kinds of health that we're talking about. And again, you might say, well, what's healthy in one place is different in another place. Sure, whatever. Those are the details. But again, you can certainly say that we want healthy children. 
How do you get that? How do you design a system that makes healthy children, that gives us a healthy next generation? Well, of course, one of the things you need is a healthy environment. Um, if the environment is making you sick, you're not healthy. And if you're making the environment so that it makes you sick, then you're not healthy. So the bottom line is, is you have to have an environment that makes you healthy, not just in your physiology, but also um, in the aesthetic qualities and, and these other issues. But I think that you can also see when you start drawing a systems diagram like this that that's clearly not enough. You can't just have a healthy environment and expect to have healthy children or healthy people. You also, for example, need healthy communities. People live in communities and they interact with each other. Nobody is a doctor and a lawyer and a plumber and a farmer and, 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 all these time, same sorts of things. We need each other uh, at this point. There's too many people on this world to try to live each one with all the skills that are required to live in this life. At the same time that an individual person can make the environment either uh, more or less healthy, the sum total of the interactions of the community also feed back to environmental health. So we have to think about things at different levels, not just the level of the person, but also the level of the city and the state and the country. Now again, that's not enough. Nobody, no place um, with the number of people that we have on this world uh, lives completely independently of all other places on this planet. And even if there is such a place that does that, the whole planet, all the people in this world don't have the ability to do that anymore. So we're going to have to have healthy trade relationships amongst groups of people. I used to use the word healthy commerce, um, but people got confused and thought that I was um, advocating for one particular economic or political system. But that's not the case. I'm not talking about whether we're having a capitalist system or any other kind or whether or not we're having socialist policies or, or any other kind. I'm just talking about the fact that people need to trade goods and services with each other in order to get the things they need. And in doing that, that affects their community structure and those two things together are affecting the environment and they're all doing it equally. So once we have the beginnings of a model like this, as we start systems thinking and applying this to sustainability, the question then is, what do you do now? Well, first you have to have some goals. You have to know what are we wanting to improve on? You can't do everything at once. Uh, you have to start somewhere. The second thing is you then need some ways to approach those goals. Yeah, people are going to differ on this. The approaches are going to differ in different places and the approaches are going to differ with goals. But you need to work on that. And thirdly, you need some ways to measure progress. If you don't do these things, then all what we've talked about before basically is a sustainability mission statement with no ability to actually do anything with it. So this then brings us to the other part of um, this talk, which is education for sustainability. As educators, one of the things that we then do is think, how do we change our educational environment? What do we do in our classroom? How do we change our educational system? How do we change our institutions? How do we change the institutions at the country level? Well, oftentimes when I give talks like this, people say, well, that's all fine and good for you, you global change biologist, you, but I'm not a scientist. What, what's in this for me? Where's my part of this? Well, as you think about the goals, in fact, um, the goals are um, one of the easier parts to think about because at the big scale, um, all the countries of the world have, in fact, agreed on a set of starting goals. And these are the Millennial Development Goals, eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, achieving universal primary education, promoting gender equality, improving maternal health, improve, reducing child mortality, on down the list. Only one of those is in fact an environmental issue, ensuring the functioning of Earth's life support systems. Um, so as you think, well, I'm not a social, I'm not a natural scientist, fine. If everybody were, we would be in serious trouble because there's all these other issues that have to be worked on simultaneously. So whether, um, whatever your role or your specialty or your passion, there's a place for that in this um, in the sustainability 
framework. In the decade of sustainability, of the decade of education for sustainable development, which is right now, by the way, the, the United Nations recognized that in order to achieve these goals, one of the most powerful tools we have is changing our educational systems. And in fact, if we don't change our educational systems, we won't change those goals. It goes both directions. So they've called on all of us educators to start educating for sustainability. It's called EFS in some circles. What does that mean? It means that sustainability must become the guiding focus and organizing principle of everything that we do. Now, does that mean that you just use the word sustainability over and over and over again until everybody wants to puke and nobody wants to be near you anymore? Of course not. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about all of the parts that go into sustainability. How are those connected together to produce a future that actually will um, be a positive future for our planet? So what might education for sustainability look like? So. Um, when the decade of education for sustainable development was first laid out, we didn't know. They said, do it. And educators said, OK, what shall we do? And the answer came back, I don't know, figure it out. Um, well, time's gone by, and we have figured this a lot now. Again, nobody knows the specifics for everybody. But we do have an idea of what to do in general. So we're talking now about learning that's about knowledge, doing, being, interacting with others, and changing the world. It's not just enough now to learn facts disconnected from other facts. We have to start thinking about how are all these things related to each other. Why might we be doing this? What are we actually trying to do? What's our goal as educators in the educational system? We're pr trying to produce people that are resilient, that can handle crises, that can adapt, um, all these issues, how do we redesign what's going on in our classrooms and in our educational systems to produce people with these qualities or to enhance these qualities that people already have? And again, how do you do that? It's different for everybody. It's different for every school at every level and for every discipline. But somehow or another, we have to build in at least some sort of hands-on relevant work that's uh, that specifically addresses dealing with the issues around sustainability. So if you then want to develop some learning objectives, core learning objectives, there's lots of sets of learning objectives out there. And what I've tried to do here is produce kind of the shortest list possible that you can have and then still say that you're doing education for sustainability. There needs to be something about content, something about complexity, systems and design thinking, place-based and locally relevant. You're teaching the students leadership skills and the tools for being agents of change. And you can't hide from the fact that these are ethical and affective values-based issues that we're talking about. Of course, you're not telling anybody how to think. And you're not telling anybody what to think. But you are telling people to think. And they have to think about all the different realms of this. It's not just facts. It's not just about um, what's right and wrong in terms of uh, yes or no. It's also in terms of what's right and wrong in terms of what's right and wrong. And everybody has to come up with these decisions for themselves. So the bottom line is that sustainability has to become second nature. It has to become second nature to our students. It has to become second nature to us. It has to be second nature within our classrooms and within our institutions. And the way to think about that is every single decision that we make every single day has to be thought of in relation to every other decision that we make. It's not that hard, really. It's not overwhelming to know that your investment choices, your consumption choices, the education that you choose for yourself all are connected to each other, and that you can't just assume that you can do one thing without affecting everything else. So really then, if we're going to capture that in kind of a cartoon, this is the sort of thinking that we need to get away from. It says here that Earth's temperature is at a 400-year high. And the other fellow says, that's OK. We've got air conditioning. Again, what about everybody outside the car? What about you when you want to step outside the car? Where's that car going to get the materials it needs to keep the people inside alive? It's not just about me here and right now. It's about all of us and into the future. So as you think to yourself, again, you know, there's a lot of bad news out there. 
Um, how do you keep from getting overwhelmed and deciding, you know, my actions are so small in relation to the overall problem that there's just nothing I can do? Um, one of the ways I, I like get pe to, to get people to think about this is again, move away from that intellectual level of thinking and go to an emotional level of thinking. Look at this picture. And when I show this picture to audiences, it's clear that you get all kinds of goofy smiles because people like baby things, right? Um, so how do you feel when you look at this picture? Don't think what is it. Don't think what are those objects. Think how do you feel? Now, you might feel irritated with me that I'm shamelessly manipulating your emotions. But on the other hand, you feel a certain way. You, most of you feel good because we like baby things. So when you think about the nurturing and the caring and the protective elements that might arise in you when you look at things like this, ask yourself, how can I bring those same emotions up when I look at a picture like this? How can we take the very concrete, specific emotions and actions that we might take in taking care of a baby and think about how are we going to apply that to taking care of ourselves on this whole planet. And if we can keep that level of emotional engagement, we're going to figure this out. Thanks for your attention, everybody.